Yep. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about a, a new browser feature um, that uh, it can be really useful for uh, web developers. And I'm hoping that more web developers will actually um, come to learn about this, this feature because it could, be, uh, could make a big difference on the web. Now, of course, I assume that most of you know what a cross-site scripting attack is. Um, the canonical example of it is some kind of web form like this that accepts user input and uh, doesn't quite do the proper filtering. So the user puts in something like this and then uh, it ends up on the final page and then it does something like this to all of the users that come into that website. Now, a similar uh, problem that, uh, that, that we can see with uh, web forms that don't do proper filtering is something like this, where people put in a tag uh, that has remote content that you may not want on your site. And of course, this will do something like this, um, <laughs> where uh, that image, it gets displayed because you didn't filter anything. Uh, you, you didn't filter it uh, properly when the user entered it. Now, there's various strategies for prevent things like the, preventing things like that from happening. The um, common way that people cause a cross-site scripting attack is by just putting in like a variable directly into the, the HTML that's going to be outputted to the page. So the, the first fix that comes to mind is to do something like this. So you escape the variable before you throw it onto the HTML. But a much better solution, of course, is to use a templating system where you will have a separate template with a placeholder, and then when you want to render the page, you pass in the variables there. Now, the cool thing about a templating system is that you can turn on auto-escaping so that variables will always be escaped, and if you do want to pass in raw HTML, you have to do something like this. Just pipe raw or whatever it is in your, temp in your templating system. Now, of course, if you have auto-escaping turned on by default, it doesn't mean it's going to be always on. Because uh, as, I just, as I've just shown with the pipe raw thing, sometimes you do need to pass in raw HTML. So you still have to be careful. Now, the real problem here, and that's the cause of these, all of these cross-site cross -site scripting attacks, is that the default for all browsers is to allow everything, to allow all inline, inline scripts to run them and to load all external content from, uh, the, the, from your website. Content security policy is a way to change this. Now, what it is, is that it's a way to tell the browsers that you want on your site. So here's a really simple example. Looking at the headers, for this hypothetical site, um, we see a new header called Content Security Policy. And normally it's all on one line, but obviously for the purpose of this slide, it's on three lines. And what you put in there is um, a, a number of directives. So the first directive is default SRC of self. What that means is that by default for all types of content, you allow content that comes from the same server. So content in this case, that comes from HTTP example.com. The second line is image SRC. This overrides the first one. So uh, the default value was self. For images, it's self and data. Now data is for the data URI, the way to inline images directly into CSS or HTML through uh, Base64 encoded stuff. Um, so that's just there to show that you can override the default and you can have more precise directives for different types of content. Here's another example, so same hypothetical site, but right now we're looking at a login page over HTTPS. Now, this um, service, uh, th this, this example happens to use Persona for logins, and Persona requires two extra things. It requires you to open a hidden iframe to uh, this URL, login.persona.org, and to load a script from the same URL. So we allow these things, so we again overwrite the default policy. Another example, this is my homepage, this, this one's a real example. So here I've got default SRC of none, which means that by default, there's no external content at all get, that gets loaded by the browsers that visit my homepage. Now, of course, I have images on it and a style sheet, so I have to relax those restrictions somewhat. And also added font. Now, can, you, can anybody see the one that's clearly missing from there? Scripts, yes. So, I, so my homepage is, is really just a bunch of links. Um, so it, it, it does absolutely nothing. And so it doesn't have any JavaScript. 
and I just disable it entirely. So you cannot go to my uh, domain to that URL and, and load and, and execute scripts because your br the browser won't let you. These are the things that you can configure through uh, a content security policy. So you can do objects, applets, scripts, style sheets, images, all of the multimedia stuff, uh, frames, fonts, Ajax requests, all of these things you can, uh, you can enable or disable separately. It works in these browsers. <coughs> There's one that's shaded there because the support isn't quite there. Um, now, the, the truth is that it really works well in the first two. Safari is, is a bit broken, so try to avoid using it there. Um, but it, but you know, if a browser doesn't support it, then uh, with the exception of Safari, um, if a browser doesn't support it, uh, basically nothing happens and, and it's just as if the content security policy wasn't there. But for those browsers that support it, then you get extra protection. So it's quite cool. What does it look like if you CSP enable your website? Well, if we look back at this example from earlier, what you're going to see is this. Now, assuming again that the, the software still doesn't filter the input, then you're going to see something like this in Firebug. The trip was blocked due to the CSP um, header. One thing to note is that unless it's explicitly allowed by your policy, all inline scripts are disabled. That's because there's no way for the browser to tell the difference between your inline scripts that you put into your application and the inline scripts that users put into your application through your lack of filtering. And so all of them are, 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 dis are disabled by default. Um, the second example with the evil image, um, this is what happens, the image is not loaded and this is what you see in the Chrome uh, console. So image is uh, refuse, refuse to load the image because of content security policy. So pretty simple. Uh, again, by default, the default, in the default policy, external resources are not loaded. So if you need to load any external resources, you need to declare them. Now, what can you do today if you want to get ready for CSP? You may not want to start implementing CSP right now, but what you should do is get ready for it at the very least. First thing you should do is this. Eliminate all inline scripts and styles, because as I said, they are uh, disabled by default unless you re-enable them. And if you do re-enable them, you're losing quite a lot of the, the value of CSP, to be honest. So if you have a script like this, and what you do is you just move it to a file, you know, pretty simple. Um, another related one is JavaScript URIs. So if you have something like this, where you have a link that when you click on it, it runs a JavaScript function, um, that's slightly more complicated, but you know, not very. Uh, you just hook the function to the button that's on the event in JavaScript. Uh, of course, not in inline JavaScript. Um, JavaScript in a file, but you get the idea. Uh, if you want to start rolling out CSP then, what I recommend is start with a somewhat loose policy. You take a guess as what your application probably needs and then you roll it out like this. So, okay, my application probably needs anything on its domain and subdomains and self and maybe the data URI. So just put in something like this, see if it works. Uh, you probably want to start with this unless you've actually fixed your application to remove all of this inline stuff. And then you can work towards a more strict policy. So maybe in your case, you can do something like this, where uh, by default, you only accept self, and then images can come from all these places, but scripts and styles only come from a single domain, like maybe a CDN or something like that. Um, so you can evolve your policy to make it a bit stricter, because um, you know, if, if, you, if you start with a loose policy, it's still better than no policy at all. There's another interesting thing that's in the spec, which is the reporting mode. Reporting mode works like this. You change the name of the header that you output to content security policy report only, and then you add in this report URI. What that does is that the browser will parse your policy and will execute it, but instead of blocking a content that should be blocked, what it will do is that it will send a report to that URL, to that, uh, URL that you specify there. Um, and, uh, but it won't actually block any of the resources. So you can try that first to, to test it out. And this is what the report that you're going to see. Basically, what resource was blocked, uh, why, like which directive was violated, 
and what page the user was on. Now, another thing that's good to do, and, um, and, and the reason for that is that it's, it's just an extra layer of security that you get out of it, is to so add the headers, the CSP headers, not in your application, but directly into your web server config. The reason for that is typically you're going to have it on like a Django application that's running as the Django user or www.data or something like that on your server. But the Apache config will be owned by root, for example, or some other user, not the Django user. So if you put something like this in your Apache config and your application gets owned, then the, the attacker is still limited by the content security policy that you have. Now that may not actually help you, but it, it might. It might make it a little bit diff more difficult to, to exploit your application. Um, so probably not a huge thing, but you might as well do it that way um, if you're using content security policy. So I want to stress that this is not a replacement for proper XSS hygiene. You still have to use your templating system, escape your variables, all of that stuff. But it is a great way to increase the depth of your defenses. And got a bunch of resources here. Um, in particular, this online tool there, CSP is awesome, was uh, written by some guy that got really excited about CSP after I gave this talk uh, at a security conference or, or last year. And that's uh, really good. It, it allows you to generate your, your policies um, quite uh, easily. The other one, the Firefox add-on, is quite cool. You can add, you can create your own CSP policies for various sites that you visit, and it will be enforced by uh, by the browser. It's also quite useful if you're developing it for your own site. Um, how much time has it got? Got it. Ten minutes. All right. Excellent. Uh, got time for a bonus HTTP header. <laughs> now this one is really cool too. Um, can anybody tell me what's wrong with this website? No HTTPS. Yeah, there's a little bit missing here, right? <laughs> now, I'm, I'm sure you can guess what sort of bad things could happen if you were using this version of the, of the website, right? Um, I'm not going to get into exactly how you force a downgrade attack of this kind, you know, the HTTPS to HTTP downgrade. If you're interested in how that works, um, look up this tool, SSL Shrimp. Uh, but basically the, the problem here is that, um, is, is that there is a downgrade. And, you know, it would be really nice if the browser would just see, hey, that's like a bank URL. I'm not, I don't really want to connect over HTTP no matter what. Um, so, how can we make this happen? Well, it turns out that this is exactly what strict transport security is. Now, this is not, uh, this spec does not consist of a list of uh, bank website URLs. Um, you know, that would be one way to do it. Um, but uh, instead, it defines a new header that the server can return. And uh, this is the header. Um, so, strict transport security, that's what you add to your responses, and then it's going to max age of some number of seconds. And that's like a couple of weeks, months, whatever. Um, so all you need to do is return this, and then the browser will cache the fact that you only want to serve your content over HTTPS for that many seconds. And then it will refuse to connect over HTTP. Yes? If you're causing a downgrade attack anyways, couldn't the attacker just not send them yeah, so it doesn't work for the first time, but it is remembered for that long, right? And the other thing is that there's also uh, there's also a preloaded list in in Chrome and uh, Firefox um, for for certain uh, URLs. But even if you're not in a preloaded list, like if you're always attacked, like if you're always being man in the middle, um, then you know it's going to suck for you. But <laughs> typically, you know, you're, you're not constantly under attack on every website you visit, so. You know, that's the same principle behind what everybody does with SSH, right? Trust on first use kind of thing. First time you see the SSH fingerprint, you're like, oh, yeah, that's probably fine. And then the second time, <laughs> you know, if they're different, then, oh, wow, well, they're different. Why don't you just shut down 480? <laughs> um, that, that, that's a really good solution, I would imagine. Um, yeah, would you like to propose that idea to uh, <laughs> appropriate standards? It's really simple. It's like if you don't want to ever transmit them, you just never transmit Oh, you mean like for the bank to turn yeah. off? No, the, the, the bank doesn't serve over that domain. It's just that the, the, you use SSL strip, and then it's like someone's, you're using someone's Wi-Fi access point, and then they give you a different IP that you connect to, 
And you know, that, that, so yeah, the bank doesn't actually this doesn't. So this is a mean in the middle of the tick, causing. Yes, yeah, so, so it's to prevent those those downgrade attacks when you're being man in the middle. Yeah. So that's all, all you need to do. It works in these browsers. Um, if it doesn't work in your favorite browser, you should switch browsers. Um, <laughs> but um, but really, you know, like for your users that use another browser, they don't get any extra security. But the ones that use these browsers uh, do. So it's pretty good. Now, if you have an HTTPS only site, there's no excuse not to turn this on. So just go ahead, add the extra header, and uh, everything will be awesome. So, have you taken questions? Yeah. Five minutes. Oh. Five minutes or something? But thank you, friends. With the strict transport security, can you just set the max age to zero and mean forever? Or? Uh, no, you cannot. You cannot set the uh, max age to zero. Um, you, you should just set a big number. Um, like the the recommended thing is set at least six months. Um, and um, if you if you do set uh, so so for browsers to actually include sites in the preloaded list, they require a certain minimum amount of time. Um, but the thing is, you know, if, if unlimited is a is a bit tricky because that means you can never ever change it. Um, so it's much better to put, put in like a year or something like that, and then if you ever have to change it for some reason, then at least you can do it in a year. Yeah. Yes. Um, you said you should not use any inline content, so inline scripts, inline star sheets. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at web pages that are out there right now, there's actually no site that would actually follow this rule. How would you actually see the chance that this will happen? So there's, there's many sites that, that use inline scripts, uh, in fact, probably most of them, um, but there are, um, but, the, but that's not actually all of them. Like in, in our case, for example, when we're building the persona service, um, we're building it without any inline scripts or, uh, or styles, specifically because we want to be able to enable CSP later on because it's a security, so a conscious uh, thing. There are websites where, um, for performance reasons, they, uh, they really need to mine a few things, in which case you can't use CSP, but then I guess you have to decide whether, you know, for, like extreme performance is more important than, um, it may not matter on your site either, you know, from a performance point of view, but sometimes, you know, you may decide that, well, it's more important than CSP. And, uh, but yeah, it is a, it is a trade off. That thing where you said IE ten supports it <laughs> was that actually is that actually what they are claiming is gonna happen or is that just tongue in cheek? Right, so the questions about IE ten support that was uh, that was kind of half there on the slide. Um, it's kind of half there in, in, in IE ten. I think it's just like reporting mode only or something like that. But it's and it may not even work fully, I don't know. I don't I don't have an IE ten browser to test with, but uh, yeah, that's, that's not really there. So my question relates to caching of that information, so specifically uh, strict transport security, but also CSP. Is CSP cached? Uh, CSP is not cached. Okay. No. Uh, and I if the user clears the, their browser cache, does the strict transport security information, is that also ca uh, cleared, or is that retained as a separate uh, yeah, so, okay, so is it in a separate area or is it part of the, of the browser history? Um, I don't know, and the answer is that it's probably different in, in Chromium and Firefox, but um, I should look it up. It would be better if it weren't uh, <laughs> clear. Oh, well, thank you.